welcome everyone to this uh, uh, Democracy Institute Hotspots uh, panel discussion. We have uh, a very exciting lineup and an even more exciting uh, topic uh, today. We are going to uh, look at uh, the relationship between democracy and corruption in Romania and Bulgaria in particular. These two countries are um, um, very interesting from this corruption democracy perspective because a lot has happened uh, in these uh, two countries. Both of them have become considerably richer in the last uh, 20, 25 years, roughly doubling their uh, GDP per capita. There, there has been also uh, an amazing or, or large uh, inflow of uh, funding into civil society and think tanks. So you would think that uh, these two combined have strengthened controls for corruption, uh, uh, um, an increasing private sector, uh, an increasing uh, civil society would uh, be effective to hold uh, elites more uh, accountable. There have been notable uh, successes, or at least distinct uh, uh, changes in institution building, uh, uh, initially as part of the accession, setting up a range of important uh, institutions like competition authorities, or the anti-corruption uh, agency in uh, Romania. We've also seen uh, uh, political competition remaining uh, healthy, especially in, com in, uh, in comparison with places like Hungary. Politicians and parties have uh, come and, uh, and uh, came and, and, and went uh, a lot uh, of them on anti-corruption tickets. So electoral accountability uh, seems to be uh, in, uh, at least working to some degree. However, results, and that's uh, something we will start uh, discussing in a second, the results are uh, uh, questionable at best. If you just look at uh, Transparency International's uh, most recent uh, uh, global corruption barometer, asking um, uh, a random sample of, of um, citizens about uh, bribery, their participation in bribery, so them paying bribes, in both countries, we see 19, 20% of uh, people admitting uh, having paid the bribe when interacting uh, with the government. That's highest numbers in Europe. And about half think that uh, corruption is getting worse. Um, but if you also look at uh, other proxies, and I'm sure uh, Alina will, will show some, and, and Alex will show some as well, if I can chip in with some uh, uh, indicators on uh, procurement corruption, high level uh, uh, corruption risks that don't, doesn't seem to be a, an improvement in uh, corruption, uh, even deterioration in uh, some regions. But also if you look at legislation, the use of emergency outside of the, the normal lawmaking uh, process uh, has been uh, widely used. There's no uh, distinct improvement there as well. So a lot has happened. We would uh, feel that there are reasons to be optimistic uh, nevertheless, the results are uh, quite uh, questionable at best. So there is uh, a lot to um, uncover what, what's going on. Why did we um, see uh, these, uh, lack of, uh, uh, this lack of progress in these uh, two countries in terms of uh, corruption and, and stagnation in terms of uh, democracy, if you like. Now, uh, let me um, uh, introduce our distinguished uh, panelists. We have here Alina Mungi PPD, Alexander Stoyanov, and Dimana Frankova. The three of them represent different perspectives. Alina comes from uh, predominantly from an academic uh, uh, perspective. She's a professor at the Hertie School and also the director of ERCAS, the European Research Center for Anti Corruption and State Building. She also has extensive uh, policy experience with uh, the World Bank, the European Parliament, and, and many others. She is also the president of the Romanian Academic Society, uh, a think tank working in, on topics of uh, corruption and anti-corruption in Romania. Our second panelist is uh, Alex, uh, Alexander Stoyanov. He is a senior fellow at the CSD, the Center for Study of Democracy. Uh, one of the major think tanks uh, in uh, Bulgaria. He has uh, also worked on uh, policy assessments, reports for the European uh, Commission, World Bank, UNDP, 
He has managed a, a great number of, of surveys of, of corruption and, uh, and other uh, related topics like uh, on tax evasion and organized crime. He also works as an associate professor at the University of National Android Economy in Sydney. Our third speaker is uh, Dimana. She's uh, an archaeologist by education, but uh, works as a journalist currently, uh, notably as the editor of the English language magazine uh, Vagabond. She has uh, also uh, uh, written a number of novels, more uh, recently, The Smile of the Dog and The Empty Cave, which will be also published in French for those of you who don't speak uh, a Bulgarian. These novels uh, linked to each other, discuss and go through um, major topics of this panel of corruption and politics in Bulgaria. So let me uh, start off by uh, inviting our speakers, first Alina, to reflect on the trajectory of corruption, corruption control in uh, Romania in the last uh, 15 years. Have you progressed? And if yes, in which respect? Thank you very much, uh, Mihaly, for, for the invitation and the pleasure to join the, the CEU community today. I hope you hear me well. So I would briefly put it like this. Uh, I haven't been a, a scholar working on Romania for, for some years now, as my interest has gone more global. But of course, I remain very involved and concerned by, by what happened in Romania. And who read my earlier work about the Romanian transition, know that I had used this, um, this model for Romania, which was called democratization without decommunization. So Romanian model was very different from the Central European model. Since Romania had a totalitarian and not an authoritarian regime, with basically no alternative elite, just a few scattered dissidents, the Romanian way to democratization basically was not by a victory of the anti-communists as in Central Europe. In fact, we never had a victory of the anti-communists. There have never been a coalition of Romanian anti-communist parties to win 51% in any elections of the past 30 years, which explains a lot of the Romanian transition. So it is a transition about continuity and commitment of the old elite, gradual commitment to democracy and to European values, to the ideal of European integration. And therefore, logically, our democratization without decommunization, no lustratia, absolutely nothing at all, was followed by, by what I call Europeanization uh, without decommunization. Right? So Europeanization, a process of Europeanization coming in a country which had not really finished its transformation. So the two processes went on in parallel. The Romanian unfinished transition with typical transition and actually development issue, like corruption, for instance. And in the same time, all this largely formal, sometimes more substantial, however, Europeanization process, like, you know, becoming really a part of the common market, opening the market increasingly, including public procurement market to European actors, because eventually, eventually, this happened since it was subject to quite a lot of conditionalities. Well, the third important chapter in this Romanian uh, revolutionary thing happened in very similar ways. We needed to do anti-corruption. We needed to do anti-corruption because the European Council in 2005 asked Romania explicitly, tied Romania's MCVs explicitly to corruption, and in fact asked for an audit of Romania's effectiveness of its anti-corruption in order for Romania to sign the treaty. It was the only country which had this supplementary request in order to sign the accession treaty. And therefore, part of Romania's acquis was the anti-corruption strategy that we put together in that audit and then the anti-corruption strategy which was directly based on the audit and this is the year 2005 the first half in 2005 by september this comprehensive strategy which included a national integrity agency to check financial disclosures and other things like this had already been put together in the same time, the camps had been 
political camps were configured, which meant that roughly all traditional parties were against this strategy, this European strategy. I, I, I should you know, tell you honestly, as a person who has been part of this process, that even we were not aware that this will in full become part of the Akis. We thought it's going to be a little bit more flexible, you know, when, when we put it together. But then we found out that even in the smallest letter of it, this was actually considered a Romanian commitment towards EU. So, you know, the third stage of this, of this long process, Romania's anti-corruption, in many, many ways, resembled with the first two. So it was um, a process which had a little bit of internal drive. You know, our anti-corruption coalition, the coalition for a clean parliament that I put together in 2004 and which generated a strong reform-minded minister, Monica Makovei, but that was all. For the rest of it, the parliament absolutely in its entirety hated these reforms. They considered them imposed from abroad, not Romanian driven. And in December uh, 2006, I remember explicitly Michael Lee, who was at the time Director General at the Enlargement Directorate, saying to Monica Makovei, but the first thing they're going to fire if we allow Romania to join a year earlier, because the discussion was between 2006 or 2007. There was this discussion about Romania and Bulgaria. The first thing they're going to do is that they're going to fire you because you are identified as the long arm of Brussels, the person who imposes to Romanian political elites these conditionalities. And of course, we were very patriotic and at the same time mindful that the opportunity window of opportunity will go away, which eventually happened because the year, that was the year of the referenda in Netherlands and France where in fact uh, enlargement stopped, except for Croatia. And it took quite a long number of years for Croatia to be able to join. And we insisted that we go in in 2007. And yes, the first half of 2007 saw the firing of Monica Makovei and the first attempt to suspend President Basescu, not for something wrong that he did. This only we, you know, this only developed in a later stage, but simply for supporting our anti-corruption campaign. And this was, in a many way, a nostalgic, very good time to which I look back, you know, with a with a good feeling because it was very clear cut who were the bad guys and who were the good guys. But this changed because what happened is that, again, since we were lacking the force of doing this, what Mr. Basescu decided, President Basescu decided is that he's going to use the old apparatus and roughly the old methods in order to have an effective anti-corruption. This meant that in, um, in Romania has a French system, so it has something parallel with the government, uh, where anything related to strategy, but roughly it means really everything important goes there. It's called the National Defense Council, chaired by the president in our semi-presidential system. So the prime minister is a lesser figure, a significantly lesser figure. And the president decided in this Supreme Defense Council, since being about defense, they're entirely non-transparent. You do not know the agenda. You do not read the proceedings. And eventually, years later, you find out what they decide. And they decided that anti-corruption is now a matter of national strategy. And from that moment on, the hair of the former of Ceausescu's dreaded Securitate, the Romanian Service of Information, roughly was given a free hand to use national security warrants to practically listen to everybody. Although we had a clear mechanism uh, to listen to wiretap people on corruption grounds, they preferred this national security mechanism. I published all these figures actually, so they were like, you know, several times more national security warrants, impressively. They simply wiretap everybody, all the parliament, all the Supreme Courts, literally all politicians in Romania. And this is how Romania's corruption became so effective out of a sudden. And there is, of course, evidence of selective prosecution. I mean, yes, they wiretapped everybody in an environment of systematic corruption, so systematic that when I published my paper that Romania's procurement evolved from 60% particularistic transactions to 49%, claiming that a page was turned. And Mihaly knows how, this, how difficult it was to put this data together you know, for two years and everything. But you know, I had a former student who was a minister for three weeks. 
uh, when the government changed. And this former student of mine visited me in my Berlin office and he said, Professor, great job, 60% to 49%. And therefore my argument was that the rule of the game has changed and Romania has now evolved. He said, you know, it was never 60%, however. He said, it has always been 100%. In other words, not even one installment in a construction contract was ever given away without a kickback. And of course, in 2005, I was putting out these nice charts to all the embassies in Bucharest, showing how small Romanian, small by number of employees and uh, by you know headquarters, but otherwise big as number of turnovers, how this number of companies, small number of companies were winning tremendous, tremendous construction contracts and they had profits rates of 40-50% in 2009 when the entire construction sector collapsed due to the economic crisis to the euro crisis and whatever whatever you want right and uh, those were that seem to be a model like I see today in Albania when only domestic companies win and European companies lose and this changed so the good thing which changed is that this radically changed if you look today at the turnover and profits in construction, you would see a lot of European companies. And I have seen that changing in that year where I was showing these charts. More and more ambassadors called me and, you know, they made the argument that this is the single market and uh, all their companies are equally entitled to, to take a share. And Basescu publicly said he disagreed. And he publicly said he disagreed with famous uh, multinationals which come and then subcontract to Romanians and that we should be allowed to somehow favor Romanian companies to, to some extent. So I think that in terms of when I see something which is like a clear benefit in Romania is that simply liberalization policies of banks, of public procurement market, of energy allowed, allowed quite a lot of foreign investment to come in and the government gave away important parts of the economy. I would say the government gave away essential parts of the economy. But nevertheless, the significant, significant trends existed. And in public procurement, where we have data or we can use the, the European Commission um, public procurement scoreboard, you would see that, you know, Romania, in fact, in the year which I, where I reported, which must have been 2016, something like this, has re had reached a peak single bidding, Mishi's favorite, uh, you know, red flag in corruption indicators, non-competitive tenders in other way, single bidding had fallen to uh, under 20%. But now they're back. If you're gonna look today in the European single market uh, public procurement scoreboard, you're gonna see that again, Romania and Bulgaria are there. But meanwhile, the Czech Republic <laughs> and Hungary and uh, Poland was always on, on top of everyone else. So basically you would see very distinctively former communist Europe uh, doing quite, quite badly, having quite a lot of non-competitive tenders, which is really a sign of fixed, of fixed procurement, of, uh, of preferential procurement. So yes, I think that in many, many ways, this country is uh, mine, I can speak more, uh, made things that I do not think a country like France ever opened its procurement market as seriously as we did and allowed other firms to come in. But on the other hand, there was, a, you know, an investigation like eight, nine years ago, which made it to front page of Politico that the French company Veolia increased the water price in Bucharest eight times in one year by paying everybody in the municipal council. And while the Romanian construction companies that I mentioned had some people sent to jail due to this Securitate, Secret Service powered anti-corruption, uh, we have never sent any, anybody of the multinationals in jail. So all this political directive, the fact that our anti-corruption is powered by Europe and therefore it is directed against Romanian economic interests, which would use too much of government authority to enrich themselves, it remained very clear and you know some people were above the law those people are not above the law anymore who is above the law now is everybody connected with the secret service i mean their companies win for instance in health corona related i mean they had really near monopolies of of everything and uh, they're well-known companies i mean their companies or connections to the secret service can be traced because they're legally allowed to have companies and again the multinational companies and the big companies related to important actors 
like United States, no, no, nobody will ever bother them, OMV, I mean the classic actors, and of course all the French companies. So it is a mixed picture. What is positive is that I think uh, petty corruption, since the country got so rich, you know, Romania has doubled their income in the last 10 years. And this contributed a lot to a collapse of, of petty corruption. Also, transparency's progress is real. Most city halls in cities now really have uh, single halls with cameras or, or everybody see what everybody else is, does. So this kind of corruption due to transparency and to raises in, in income has disappeared. On the other hand, anti-corruption in Romania really strained rule of law. And I would appreciate that rule of law is in, uh, is in a worse shape now than it was when we started anti-corruption. After all, in 2005, I was dragged to court in over 20 different trials by generally by the social democratic politicians, but very important politicians, Minister of Internal Affairs, Minister of Justice, one head of Secret Service, and I never lost. I never lost in any court, simply because you know I blacklisted them as part of an anti-corruption campaign. While today, it is really, really very, very mixed. The part of courts are definitely not as free as they were, and prosecutors, we started to make them free, and now I can really say that, again, this window of opportunity is over, and there are obvious, obvious proof of, of political intervention in the prosecution, which is also mentioned in Greco reports and, and other things. So the picture is mixed, and I'm worried about democracy. If I am to end, I will end with a forecast now. And I would say that Romania now, I mean, as we speak, the government coalition, which is allegedly the right wing liberal anti-communist coalition, just fired the ombudsperson. Although there is not a shred of evidence that this person ever trespassed the constitution, the only reason for which you can fire an ombudsperson, but simply because she was critical of the government, which is something that by definition the ombudsperson should do. So, and the next thing that they're gonna do is that they're going to replace everyone in the constitutional court at the earliest opportunity to get a court which never rules against government. Now the court's decisions are mixed. So sometimes they rule with them, but in many opportunities, they rule also rule against. They stopped a lot of abuses in the same way they ruled against the previous government, the SPD government, when they tried to modify the criminal code, it was actually Romanian constitutional court which helped them. So what I think, where I think we are, since we always had this significant historical lag, I think Romania is now in the year when Giurciani in, in Hungary uh, confessed on tape that they're corrupt and they lied to the people and whatever, whatever, whatever. And people thought it is really the end of the world. Oh, these former communists who are corrupt and whatever and whatever, not realizing that the coalition which was formed at Orban, which was waiting in the shadows, had a far more dangerous design than corruption. It was using corruption just instrumentally, not as with the end of enrich, just enriching themselves in order to control and never lose elections again. And uh, honestly, I think this is what our people are doing now. They are looking how to get rid of constitutional court after the ombudsman. So I think that what is worst uh, is still to come. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, ending on this positive note. I, I honestly do hope you will avoid uh, installing an Orban-like uh, uh, president in the near future. Okay, thanks a lot. So let's move on to Bulgaria. Alex, do you want to uh, share with us uh, your initial thoughts? Uh, yes. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Uh, in order to shorten uh, uh, my presentation, I will share uh, uh, a chart which shows the Transparency International scores, uh, the Corruption Perception Index for Bulgaria and Romania uh, for uh, quite a long period, since uh, 1998, including the, the uh, past year. Uh, so uh, the, the, uh, the orange, uh, the orange uh, line here with uh, uh, with all the figures, uh, is Bulgaria. Uh, uh, Alina already told you about Romania. Uh, so, uh, in terms of uh, uh, progress, you will see that uh, 
uh, uh, quite uh, uh, for Bulgaria, a peak of about 40, uh, 40 something uh, points on the Transparency International score, which is from zero to 100, was reached about uh, the time the country became an EU member. It was the same time with Romania. And then uh, uh, it has been fluctuating and uh, uh, practically this, uh, this figure, uh, 2007, uh, the level reached at that time uh, has not progressed significantly. I, I would say it has been stagnating. There is practically no change in Bulgaria. Uh, <clears throat> uh, of course, there have been different governments over this period. But uh, before the uh, EU membership, before 2007, there has been a, a, a lot of ent enthusiasm on behalf of Bulgarian governments and some sincere efforts to tackle corruption. Uh, the specific uh, anti-corruption activity uh, in Bulgaria, however, has not been uh, in the Romanian style, which is, uh, uh, I would say, the Romanian style would be court-based. Uh, uh, prosecuting and uh, sentencing corrupt officials at the highest levels of government. In Bulgaria, it has rather been associated with uh, reforms in different sectors that would reduce the opportunities for corruption. Uh, I would not say this has been uh, very successful, but it has uh, substantially decreased the levels of corruption which we witnessed in the end of the 90s. Uh, since then, however, uh, the lack of uh, judiciary uh, input into this anti-corruption uh, drive, which was established before EU membership, uh, the, this lack of judiciary input has been a basic impediment to all kinds of reforms. So uh, what happened during these years in Bulgaria? Uh, until approximately uh, the, the date of EU membership, I would say about 2005, for a period uh, uh, from 1995 to 2005, uh, main corruption was associated with uh, two main areas. One was the area of privatization. So this period <clears throat> was a period when uh, all the main assets, practically everything that uh, that has been on the table for privatization was privatized. Still, the, the state, uh, the government is keeping some assets, mainly in the energy sector. And second, uh, uh, lower level officials were actually practically allowed to extract uh, rents whenever, wherever they could. Uh, there, is, there are many notorious cases like doctors, uh, traffic police guys, uh, uh, customs officials, etc., uh, which in Bulgaria have become notorious for taking big bribes. Uh, but uh, nothing has been done to prosecute, uh, convict uh, uh, any of them, or very few of them were uh, convicted during this period. And this type of behavior on behalf of all control agencies in, and the judiciary has continued to date. So the, uh, in terms of uh, number of corruption cases, uh, since anti-corruption and conflict of interest uh, laws were introduced, that's prior to 2007, the numbers of people convicted per year uh, range from uh, 30 to about 60, 70, not more. And most of these people are uh, officials at uh, lower levels of government. Uh, the higher levels, like, the, uh, like uh, it was done in Romania, has not uh, uh, been uh, targeted at all. And uh, this, is, uh, this has been a major criticism, both on behalf of the public, uh, the opposition, uh, the European Union, uh, uh, all kinds of institutions that are um, reviewing uh, Bulgarian anti-corruption and uh, reforms in the judiciary. Uh, just because uh, a mechanism was installed when Bulgaria became a European uh, Union member, 
It's called CVM, uh, Cooperation and Verification Mechanism. I think uh, Romania too participated in this. I don't know whether it has been lifted. It has been modified recently in the last years. Uh, but there, there have been uh, reviews of for Bulgaria, rule of law and anti-corruption. These were the main issues since 2007 and practically very little progress has been made. Not enough to lift uh, this mechanism, uh, supervisory mechanism uh, of the legislation and uh, uh, law enforcement in the country. Uh, the, the change uh, which happened after uh, the uh, uh, EU membership was that uh, uh, the main sources of uh, corruption income of rents, corruption rents at the higher level, higher political and business level, shifted from uh, uh, privatizing it, uh, 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 companies uh, using all kinds of tricks to pay as little as possible uh, and uh, raise money uh, as much as possible. Uh, I will not go into details because it is it is a very long story. Uh, but uh, the the accent, uh, the the uh, the main effort shifted to exploiting public funds and European funds. So uh, uh, as uh, uh, as Alina mentions, uh, both countries became richer, and there were uh, more money to be appropriated by uh, procurement, that's one major source. Second major source are European funds. <laughs> and third main source is the enforcement of uh, tax collection and uh, customs uh, dues collection. So uh, people in power and the companies uh, associated with these people, uh, they were called by one of the politicians uh, in uh, 2008 or nine, that every party has a circle of companies around it. Uh, so there are, with each government, uh, there comes uh, several oligarchs and some beneficiary companies who profit a lot and they're linked to a, a, a even a wider circle of companies uh, who are uh, connected to the government. So we have oligarchs, connected companies, and all the rest. So uh, these people have been able to uh, both block uh, the enforcement of taxation laws. Uh, now we have uh, now an interim caretaker government, and they have uh, revealed that the, uh, the tax is not collected in the uh, last four years amount to about 5 billion euro. Uh, uh, and these are mainly uh, uh, concentrated in uh, government connected companies. This investigation is, uh, is ongoing, uh, but the figures are mind blowing for all these uh, things. So this has evolved, but in order to ensure uh, that this uh, system has been, uh, will be working smoothly, uh, the government that took uh, uh, the party which took, uh, uh, no, which uh, won the elections in 2009, uh, it was, uh, its name is GERP, uh, and uh, its prime ministers has actually, with a brief interruption in 2013 and 14, uh, been a prime minister of the country till uh, two, three months ago, Boyko Borisov. So he and his party, they have managed uh, to actually to set up uh, a system of total control over several sectors. And these sectors are uh, first the executive. Uh, actually, the current uh, caretaker government is trying to replace some ministers and chiefs of uh, important government agencies. And uh, the, the previous establishment, not the ministers, they are, they have resigned. They're blocking uh, these uh, resignations at all possible levels. For example, uh, 
the the trade register which has to record these replacements of government companies the replacement of directors they refuse to record these changes and they are thus blocking the the uh, the replacement for example of the uh, one of the hospitals uh one the the, the only uh, government owned bank etc so they're blocking uh, in all possible ways then uh, the judiciary uh, it has uh, been subjected to government influence several uh, conversations have been leaked and judging by the the way people uh, who everybody suspects of being corrupt or involved in some illegitimate actions are shielded by uh, the judiciary <coughs> uh, everyone uh, 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 considers that uh, there should be a fundamental reform of the judiciary especially the prosecution uh, final touch in this respect is that the current minister of interior he said uh, he publicly said that he doesn't trust the judiciary and all the cases he is investigating related to the previous governance uh, government uh, he will probably not forward to the prosecutor because he doesn't trust them so there is a huge conflict in this respect uh, also the media have been monopolized and uh, mostly fully controlled uh, and uh, the, the main source uh, of uh, rent uh, extraction so to say has been a new scheme which has is being uh, uh, discovered by the investigated rather by the interim government is the bypassing of the procurement legislation the trick they're uh, doing the uh, they have been doing is to actually form a big state company uh, uh, transfer uh, sums of about two to three billion euro for example for road construction and then for this company to uh, hire firms uh, to do uh, road construction works without public tenders so they're passing the procurement uh, uh, the procurement uh, legislation procedures etc fully uh, and uh, not even that but they have dispersed this uh, money uh, in advance so uh, about between uh, 500 and 1 billion euro 500 million 1 billion euro have been paid in advance for something that has not been completed yet so this these investigations they are ongoing uh, <clears throat> so uh, what uh, i will not go uh, back in history but it is uh, quite similar to uh, the romanian history uh, uh, we didn't have a, a revolution could you, wind up quickly? could you wind up your introduction in a few minutes thank you Oh yeah, sure. Uh, we don't I didn't have a, a grassroots uh, movement, uh, protest movement and a revolution. It was rather a coup within the Communist Party. And uh, the evolution is very similar to the Romanian example. Uh, however, the moment, uh, current moment, uh, is probably crucial, probably because we are still not sure. We had elections in April, but they were not decisive. No government could be formed. So we are having the new elections again uh, in 20 days. And uh, hope is that uh, the new opposition will win. And this uh, system, uh, which I described very briefly, will be done away with uh, gradually. Probably it will take years but that's uh, not a very certain outcome so um, that's for the introduction thank you very much alex uh, i uh, enjoyed quite a bit of your introductory thoughts and i think it is definitely a common theme how political parties uh, build around them uh, a set of uh, entrepreneurs oligarchs if you like uh, as instruments of corrupt anti-corruption 
that's something we have seen in quite a few countries in the region. Okay, moving on to, to Dimana, um, very, very eager to hear from you your initial thoughts. Uh, we have heard both from Alina and, and Alex, uh, the sort of numbers heavy and uh, higher level, you know, a few stories. So over to you, some, some li lively stories about uh, Bulgaria. Thank you, thank you very much, Michali. Uh, and uh, actually, Alex and Delina were very exhaustive. I mean, very detailed, and I think that they brought a very precise picture on what is going on in Romania, and specifically for Bulgaria, because I can talk about Bulgaria more. Uh, this is why I wanted to 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 put the focus on on the on the experience of the ordinary Bulgarian rather than numbers and data. And it is interesting because in the late 90s and the early 2000s where uh, this uh, strong feeling of corruption in Bulgaria prevailed because of the privatization, a lot of people in Bulgaria actually hoped that when Bulgaria joins the EU, Europe will take over corruption in Bulgaria and will, and will help Bulgaria to become less corrupt. And this was uh, because we all thought that, um, you know, European institution had a con stricter control, uh, less ties with the Bulgarian environment and the establishment. They will help the general public, of course. And this probably affected the way people perceived corruption directly after 2007 when Bulgaria joined the EU. But uh, the then government, um, which was a coalition party between social, the socialists and two other parties, uh, was very strongly connected to, uh, to corruption. And actually one of the coalition partners before the elections in 2009 said this uh, infamous phrase that each party has a circle of companies around it. And because this particular party is a minority party and it's a very controversial one, a lot of Bulgarians were kind of enraged because of this, what did, uh, this politician had said, and they voted for the so-called anti-communist <laughs> party, which was GERP. So uh, the, the party which we now see is uh, bringing corruption, the, corrupt, the feeling of corruption to the highest level since Alex uh, since Alex's survey has started, actually uh, took power on an anti-corruption ticket. They said, we will, we will, you know, we, the Europe likes us, we have European in our name, we are friends with the uh, European National Party, etc., etc. Everything will be fine. Uh, what happened is that they actually kind of used their European connections to hide their corruption, or probably, or probably, I don't want to, to say this yet, say this publicly, but maybe Europe is aware of what's going on in Bulgaria, but they just decide not to take any any action at all. So this was the this was what Bulgarians thought about this at the moment, because now they started seeing corruption going up and the Europe doing nothing. Because we, the European Commission had these regular uh, reports about Bulgaria and Romania tracking their progress in terms of democracy and economy and human rights and corruption. And uh, from Bulgarian's point of view, Romania was, uh, was an excellent example for fight against corruption. We saw Romanian politicians go into jail and we were asking what's going on, why this doesn't happen in Bulgaria as well, what's wrong with us. And then the European Commission would issue these reports and actually they would evaluate Bulgaria and Romania roughly in the same way. So Bulgarians started to become more skeptical about the EU's role in tackling the corruption. And I, don't, I, I believe now that the, the, the sentiment even among pro-European people in Bulgaria that the European Union has failed in tackling the corruption in Bulgaria. Um, regarding the recent events, so with uh, our recent uh, elections and the upcoming ones, uh, there was this feel of uh, optimism when Bulgaria finally formed a, uh, a parliament, which all very devised and uh, very sh a short one, kind of brought some hope that uh, we can break with this uh, uh, tight net of uh, interdependencies which GERP has built for the last uh, 12 years. But uh, what will happen in the next elections, it remains to be seen. There is definitely a strong opposition among the part, uh, the GERP and GERP affiliates. They are uh, at all levels of uh, government, 
uh, and administration from top level to I'm not kidding, uh, like uh, regular school directors and uh, these type of people. So there, there will be resistance, uh, of course, and we are seeing this resistance. What will happen? I want to be optimistic, but uh, I don't want to jinx things. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Dimana. With this, we are done with the short uh, opening uh, uh, introductions. Um, let me propose the following. I have a, a bunch of questions, so I will just uh, pick one of them. And then uh, please, our audience, submit your, your questions and comments on, on Facebook, and we will see them here in, in the Zoom app we are using. So we will be able to move on to some uh, Q&A interaction with the audience in the next uh, 15, uh, 20 minutes and uh, closing uh, with, with that. Now, Dimana, just uh, making a little link to what uh, uh, Alina, both uh, uh, Alex uh, mentioned, I think the EU's role, is EU's role is critical here and there have been, me being a Hungarian, I think I can share this uh, sentiment that the EU will resolve our uh, corruption problems. It has not. It has uh, let uh, you know, quite uh, surprising things uh, happen in, in places like, like Hungary, but also in, in other countries, Bulgaria and Romania. But I think one important point in, in case is that the EU as a liberalizing force, liberalizing markets, has stood up to, uh, uh, to a large degree to its uh, uh, credentials. So it has shrank the, say, the space for corrupt trends uh, at least in, in that sense. And it has also protected investments. Even under Orban, we haven't seen uh, a German car manufacturer being confiscated by the government, right? So there are still red, clear red lines, right? I mean, just that's the joke, right? I mean, Orban confiscating a, a, a car factory, right? Um, it, can, it happens in other corrupt regimes and other autocratic regimes. It has not happened in, in Hungary. And the, the EU is a clear reason for that. Now, moving on to the question of democracy and corruption, uh, you already mentioned uh, quite a few interesting things, and I would like to hear your views on, on electoral accountability, on the relationship between corruption and democracy. Standard uh, political science theory would predict that as the, uh, uh, we observe free and fair elections, you know, some question marks, but still free and fair elections, the corrupt would be voted out. And if uh, clean governments are important for voters, they would consistently vote for clean uh, parties and hence gradually would see, see a drop in, in corruption levels in these countries. We have seen changes of government. We have seen a lot of past uh, uh, politicians being in, in jail or uh, being prosecuted for corruption. Still the levels of corruption both in Romania and Bulgaria, we, we can argue that hasn't fundamentally uh, changed, at least not in all of our things. So my question is, what has uh, gone wrong? How come uh, competitive elections did not produce uh, cleaner governments and a lower level of corruption? Maybe let's start with Alina so that Dimana can rest a little bit. Thank you very much, uh, Mishu, for this question. I think there are a group of, um, of political, of, um, of policy scientists who um, have some sort of group of studies, I've seen some papers over the years, who simply calculate the gap between scientific disciplines and, and practice, and what are the real questions in policy. And I think that our questions, for instance, on, on democracy and corruption, would really go directly feed into this gap, because in many, many ways, and I share them, you know, I have I put questions like this 10 years ago. They're extraordinarily naive questions. Okay, so uh, Romanian voters voted in 2004 the corrupt people out of the office. So following the high profile coalition for a clean parliament that I put together, despite most media shunning us, but of course with some European support and with a lot of, you know, little media supporting us and really grassroots activism. All the Romanian civil society under one banner as we have never seen since, 
and we managed to make voters vote the bad guys out. They had 25% advance in polls at the beginning of elections, and they lost simply because on this black list that we made, this government party, which was doing so well in polls, the Social Democrats, uh, had far more people blacklisted than their competitors, right? So voters did their job. They voted them out, okay? And they elected Basescu and his gang. Now, at the time, Social Democrats were very vicious. Not only they sued me in various courts, but they tried to tell us that everything, to tell the public that everything was uh, a manipulation of anti-corruption, which is generally what, what politicians would say about anti-corruption, that it's instrumentalized by their opponents, and that we were hand in hand with Bosescu and we only wanted to help Bosescu in elections. And then I made the solemn public promise that I will continue to do this every four years. And in fact, this happened, even if, you know, I have left Romania 12 years ago, but the Coalition for Clean Romania, I managed to secure them grants, and I always managed to keep a clear eye, a review eye, so that nobody controls the process, so that every important election, there is some sort of oversight and blacklists are made where you, which are truly comparable, where all the candidates of all the parties are treated the same. Now, what happened is that four years after our resounding victory, which was due to the fact that one party at the time was far more corrupt than the other parties, simply because they had governed more than twice the time of the other parties. Okay, but since the other parties came to government, four years later, corruption of all the parties was already aligned. So, in fact, there was no clean alternative on the table. And by Bosescu's second term, you know, Bosescu, he instrumentalized all this and, you know, appointed Monica and prosecutors and high profile arrests started and everything, right? But, you know, it, Bosescu was not in office three, four years until I became aware, you know, and Monica was aware and the Bosescu's main presidential advisor, his foreign policy advisor resigned because of this. We were all aware that uh, his favorite person, this woman who was his favorite and uh, his official lady, so to speak. And she was, of course, married and her husband was Il Capo de Tutti Capi. So basically, our anti-corruption was used for, by this group to displace the old rents from the Social Democrats and to come over to them. They were not even, you know, the National Liberal Party's game. They were like a private gang. But this private gang, managed in uh, in Basescu's 10 years term, because 10 years it's also quite a lot, he had two successive terms, they managed to create huge rents. I mean, they for only what they, only their control of the property fund and what they restituted in property was far more important than all the arrests and the proceed that our very successful anti-corruption agency put together in five years. You know, just to give you an example. And they were untouchable. They were untouchable for many years, you know. I could not believe this for two, three years. I tried to encourage prosecutors. I was on live TV at an audience of many millions saying that if people want to do something against Elena Udra, this person, I was feeding the whole international media on her and I was sending reports to DG Radio as Basescu had put this woman in charge of all EU funds, if you can imagine. So on one hand, we had the top anti-corruption praised in the MCV reports as the top anti-corruption anywhere in the world, since success stories are missing and they're still missing. But on the other hand, the corruption was raising equally catastrophic level, you know, so it was like a competition between the two. And uh, what I really, uh, I, you know, have against the, the Europeans is the fact that MCV never mentioned Elena never mentioned the fact that this whole gang, DG Radio, listen to me. So they cut all EU funds, for instance. They cut all EU funds. I think it was in, uh, um, what year is that? 2009 or 2010. They entirely cut all EU funds because I simply sent them a note saying that there were not, audits were not even planned, you know, let alone carried on. There was no audit planned. I mean, why do any audits when you give the entire structure funds to whoever you want? Okay, and then they cut their funds and they said, you know, at least the former, you have to do some audits, you have to do something, right? But in the regular MCB reports, there was never any mention of any of this. 
You know, I struggled with Monica to create this national integrity agency. It was a big effort negotiating informally with all the parties for a year. We create the agency, right? We create the agency, but we do not control who's appointed. And a guy is appointed on whom I later find out from a TV talk show. His brother shows up in a TV talk show when they have a family argument. And he says that uh, this head, who was also a Secret Service guy, bought this position with 15000 dollars just fifteen thousand dollars you know that was the cost to become the head of the first historical national integrity agency then some years later you know some years later when basescu's terms were, were running out these agencies needed to reorient themselves they didn't know who is next and how to position themselves all right and they didn't place similar bets on the successors so the head of the National Integrity Agency and the Secret Service bet against the current president, Mr. Johannes, and they in fact start the legal proceeding to prevent him from becoming president. And what happens? So not only Bosescu in his last year, his entire family is indicted. Udra is indicted. Her husband is charged. But when? Only in his last two, three months in office. And the year after this, you know, after 10 years. But Mr. Johannes becomes president. People vote for him, right? Well, what happens in the next six months? The head of the National Integrity Agency, who had tried to stop him on grounds of incompatibility, is arrested. But I mean arrested and prosecuted by DNA, Romanian Prosecutorial Agency. So the other agency, we have two, right? MCV reports make no mention of the fact that the head of one praised agency, DNA, arrests the head of the other very praised agency in the NA reports, <laughs> National Integrity Agency. The guy goes to jail and waits in preventive arrest many, many, many months, right? Eventually he is charged. And after a number of years, significant number of years, four or five years, he is entirely cleared by the Supreme Court of Justice, entirely cleared. None of this story that I'm telling you now, which is really like a Soviet story. I only heard stories like this in Ukraine and places like this when the head of one anti-corruption agency arrests the head of the other anti-corruption agency and that this, and then the Secret Service comes and arrests somebody. I mean, it's a typical post-Soviet story. None of this is ever in any MCV report. Okay, so let alone that they don't have any data on what really goes on except the data that we generate. Okay, that's all right. But at least this, I mean, if you really are into qualitative data, if at least you are into arresting top profile people and the rest of this, I mean, why not even mention, why not call another audit? So we had an audit in 2004. I think the time has come for another audit of the Romanian anti-corruption. And I would really trust people who are not politicians and not bureaucrats, but I would really trust, you know, pensioners from Germany, from uh, Netherlands. You know, let's put together an audit of pensioners who come and really look at some of these high profile cases. I mean, really, they would write a fantastic book or maybe, you know, do another sequence to law and order. Great. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alina. Fantastic stories and really to the point of the relationship between corruption and electoral accountability and democracy. Alex, do you want to um, pick up the thread? And, uh, yeah, uh, yes, yes. <clears throat> Uh, well, uh, I, I would not uh, tell a very long story, but uh, some, uh, some statements we have, which have become very popular, they, they have been uh, made by politicians at, at different points of time, and they describe the situation. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, that uh, the statement that uh, there is corruption, but, no one, but we are not corrupt. Uh, you have to prove that we are corrupt. Uh, uh, that's, that has been a, a, a something which uh, has been rephrased by different uh, public officials at the highest level since the 90s. And this continues uh, to date. Um, the latest example is uh, um, uh, a ruling uh, of the uh, Financial Department of Finance of, uh, of the United States. Uh, there is a law, Magnitsky law, uh, according to which they sanction uh, foreign officials for corruption and abuse of human rights. So the sanctions they they uh, they are linked to uh, United the United States and the dealings of uh, banks that uh, have uh, dealings with American banks. 
but they have uh, uh, made a ruling uh, issued that recently about 10 days ago uh, in which they mentioned three uh, uh, high profile cases and six lower profile cases from the ruling party etc etc so the response of the prosecutions and those who were accused was give us why don't you give us the evidence because everyone proves that we are not corrupt we are uh, uh, white and clean we have not uh, done anything wrong we are law abiding citizens so you have to prove the opposite and um, uh, uh, officially the prosecutor's office uh, bulgaria they have uh, asked uh, the the ministry of finance no department of finance the us department of finance to provide evidence so this story has been repeated uh, not with asking uh, a foreign country for evidence but um, asking for proof this story has been repeated uh, all, all the time since the 90s uh, so every uh, there is corruption nobody is corrupt then came the the next statement uh, on behalf of one of the interior ministers of bulgaria uh, during the gerp uh, years that uh, corruption is just a feeling a perception there is no probably not no corruption it is just a feeling that people have so uh, if you want to say something different you have to prove it uh, and uh, uh, those who prove it are directly controlled by the ruling party the the main uh, proving agency is the prosecution and uh, the problem with that in bulgaria is that it is hierarchical and the prosecutor general can stop any investigation so uh, all uh, prosecutors they are not only uh, administ administratively uh, uh, subordinate to the prosecutor general but uh, substantively too so he can stop any investigation everywhere in the country and uh, then the third one is that always the opposition is corrupt and the fourth one is uh, now what we call omerta that uh, even though uh, uh, as uh, dimana said uh, uh, somebody comes wins the election uh, on the, an anti-corruption ticket and promises to uh, investigate prosecute and sentence uh, the previous governments uh, there is a, a talk some kind of investigation and then everything stops so in the end nobody is convicted so this is a very long story it has uh, a lot of background linked to the previous regime to the secret services to the uh, background deep state links etc etc i would not go into this because it would be, be very long the, the the problem is that um, any anti-corruption effort uh, is uh, of two types um, not every but those who we, which we have with, witnessed uh, well, the first type is that uh, it is uh, just uh, imitating uh, some kind of anti-corruption activity but is doing nothing and the second one uh, we currently have an agency anti-corruption agency which has a lot of power it is used to uh, used against the opposition so it it is used uh, as a suppression punishment uh, or something uh, too uh, regarding the voting voting the corrupt people out uh, there were some hopes uh, the first hope uh, was uh, with uh, in 97 uh, when uh, we think transition started in bulgaria we had an anti-communist government but they didn't sentence anyone even though there were a lot of reasons uh, so uh, what comes up uh, now 20 more plus years later is that there probably was a deal for this transfer of power uh, for the communist government to give up power to the opposition that nobody will be prosecuted uh, the next hope was GERP which was elected on anti-corruption uh, promises they did nothing now we have a new situation there is a new hope uh, but nobody dares to predict what would happen that that is the situation in bulgaria currently 
in um, we had elections in April, as I mentioned, we have 20, uh, 240 seats. Uh, these opposition uh, parties, they had about 92 and the majority is 121. So if we, if they reach 121, something could happen. We are not sure what, but something could happen. If they have less, then there will be deals, there will be compromises, and uh, we end up in the old story. So, we'll Thanks see. a lot, Alex. So, Dimona, maybe you want to pick it up where Alex left it and think about electoral accountability and the, and the possibility of change. Yes, in, yes. Uh, voting the corrupt out one in, in the near future. What do yeah. you what do? You Yes, indeed, I, I would like to, to, to say something on, on a lighter note. And this is that uh, if there is this theory about electoral accountability, the Bulgarians have, have gone beyond themselves to prove this wrong. Because uh, we have il systematically elected uh, the rascals out. We did this in 1997. Then we did this in 2001 when we elected our former king who returned as a prime minister to weed the previous corruption out. Then apparently his government was corrupt as well. So then we elected the former communists to fight with the corruption he was involved, his government was involved in. And then the so socialist-led coalition was so corrupt that we voted GERP in on an anti-coalition ticket. And then we re-elected GERP several times. So <laughs> I think that Bulgaria really, really proves the theory about electoral accountability to be a very nice theory, but still a theory. Indeed, it's uh, one of the theories and, and thank you Dimana for this. And uh, so we received a comment on, uh, on Facebook, which is very handy because that would have been my next thought on this, which is political party finance, right? Uh, there are some uh, theories and there are some uh, research uh, turning around this idea of electoral accountability and uh, simply uh, suggesting that the, the mechanism goes in the opposite direction. Democracy corrupts political parties. And basically this happens because winning elections is a risky and expensive enterprise. So political parties have to secure uh, financing for winning elections, uh, you know, also for you know, more uh, forceful tactics like buying off opposition and silencing journalists, so on and so forth. And that is very expensive, so they rely on, hence become beholden to uh, business interests, which then demand payback. Regulation, in state-backed loans, in procurement contracts, what have you. So the question here from the audience, and I would very much like to echo that question is, what has happened in this domain of political party finance? Have we seen uh, the corrupting, potentially corrupting force of money in politics paint uh, or, or changed in uh, Romania and, and Bulgaria? And I would like to see, you know, Imana, if you wanna take first, or Alex or Alina, I don't wanna stick to the same uh, line. Who wants to go first? Okay. Whatever, you, whatever you decide. Okay, I'll go. I'll go. So first, let me just sum up this electoral accountability thing. No, so it's not that the theory is wrong. The theory of electoral accountability would predict that voters are able or are not able to throw the bad guys out. And as we basically said, the theory worked in both Romania and Bulgaria voters when there is a non-corrupt alternative or somebody who pledges credibly to change the system they orient themselves towards that thing the thing is so electoral constraints work corrupt people have lost office repeatedly in favorable electoral circumstances like my 2004 circumstance when a clearly corrupt party was opposing some parties of which people didn't know much about, right? Because they were new. You cannot really tell if they were corrupt or non-corrupt because they were just not, they were new, right? Okay, where, where I think uh, it is wrong, but there is no theory that I know of which predicts this, 
is that electoral accountability is a, suffici is a, a sufficient condition to control corruption. Because obviously it is not, all right? And I would like for uh, you know, people who have not read me to just sum up in a phrase on how corruption works. Corruption works as uh, this theory of, um, of crime as an opportunity predicts, is that when a lot of opportunities for corruption exist, you need sufficient constraints to balance them. And we have to understand that our societies really produce a tremendous amount of opportunities. Think of all the EU funds which are going to come now for recovery of, uh, after, after Corona. It's really flooding our societies just with opportunities for being corrupt. And the system that we have, I mean, again, asking about party finance, is taking a very narrow view. It's presuming that you can separate party funding from this you know, overall pool of perks. You cannot. We really have systems in which the government is still very, very strong and can decide winners in the market. And therefore, uh, it's not just about party funding. It's a variety of links. But then the driver's seat is not yet the company as in the very advanced economy. It's not the company which corrupts the government, but it's simply a very high power asymmetry with the government so strong that whoever comes in, the multinationals which came in instead of the domestic companies, which I was blacklisting 15 years ago, uh, are now doing the same. They're now you know, playing kickbacks, playing the influence game, whatever needs to be done, they now do it, okay? So only it's no longer a small group of, uh, of connected company, but it is really a broad group, you know? Now it's Veolia, who's also above the law because after 12 years, they closed their files. They were not even charged, you know? They were given around as an example, but in the end, they were not even charged. So, um, you know, if you look at the rules, the whole list in Europe, it's the most advanced in rules in party finance, which exist all over the world. Many, many countries have banned, for instance, donations from legal entities. Donations from private people have been uh, reduced with very small thresholds. So on paper, there is really nothing else much that we can ban in terms of party funding. We also give a lot of public funding, which if you look at the Scandinavian model should help, but parties have not become more corrupt. And they cannot become more corrupt because what we did not manage to reduce is the discretionary power of these parties and their amount of intervention in the economy. So as long as they have this power over companies, it really doesn't matter how they are funded because companies will find a way to, to reciprocate, you know, and to pay for the favors that they receive from the government. If not legal, then illegal. You know, I think Mishi proved in, in one of his paper that in fact, the more restrictions you put, the more actually uh, party funding becomes illegal. They start carrying baggages of cash around. This is, this is more or less what happens. Now, the question is, if we have electoral accountability, why don't we manage to reduce this power asymmetry? I think that this is the, the real question. Why do, don't we manage to do that? And I think, you know, there are, you know, two answers on this. Again, pertaining to this model of mine of, uh, of the fact that you have to have this balance between opportunities and constraints. First is that opportunities have been tremendous. I mean, look at countries such as Malta, you know, which was a tiny clean country. I was about to put it in one of my success stories books about countries which managed to transition from very corrupt to less corrupt and then if you look and i went to malta and i interviewed a lot of people after this caruana galicia story and i asked what happened with this country 15 years ago you really seem to move to the upper echelon and now it really seems like you are you know a criminal organized crime running the government and they told me eu funds happened to Malta. this is what happened we were flooded by funds and we're a small weak country i mean for us it was absolutely sufficient and i think that this is really the case in our countries as well there's simply far too many opportunities yet in terms of constraints yes electoral constraints works work but there are other people which don't work in terms of constraint everyday constraints don't work so associativity is still very low. There are no strong interest groups in societies against corruption, which are behind political parties, let's say union leaders, like behind social democrats, 
or let's say, you know, Christian associations, like behind Christian Democrats in Germany, and who would say, you know what, this party is going to stop corruption. Now there is nothing of the sort, you know. The bar in Romania, the lawyers, the bar is universally a corrupt association. Okay, and everybody, including the president of Romania, the current one, which I thought, I cited a lawsuit of, uh, of his, uh, you know, against the National Integrity Agency. So they had a court. Whom he did he select as a lawyer? You know, the top fixer. So what kind of judicial independence can be in a country where it's lawyers who actually take the bribes to judges? Nobody else. It's lawyers who bribe the judges. Okay, again, this is something which is not mentioned in, in any MCV report. If you ask today, whom do you expect to take a bribe to the judge? It's still the lawyers. Why don't we have an alternative bar? Why don't we break the monopoly of this bar? And this happens if you go association, there is no strong business association which really invests in anti-corruption. They are stronger themselves. I mean, they no longer let themselves be extorted about you know, buildings, uh, permits, and things like this. I think that here, it is a little bit more power to civil society. People defend themselves very well. Plus, as I told you, you know, our judiciary, at least if you put three instances, one after another, first instance, appeal and recourse, uh, is generally good. And it was good even during social democrats. The proof is that I am not in jail. You know, I have not never lost any hearing. The justice in the end of the day defended me. You know, I thought that it's a big civil society story. But my former law professor Stephen Holmes, when when I told him this great success story in 2005, he told me, but this only proves that the courts are free in Romania and that they work. And he was right. You know, he was right in South Korea. Somebody did something similar. Also a scholar like me, he went to jail for two years. Right. Later, we edited book to, books together, but this is, uh, you know, what I mean is uh, what I mean is that uh, society is not strong enough. Voters are. We created a new small party, a new party which was supposed to be a civil society party. You know, uh, since this party needed funding, again the naivety of the funding question. In Romania, a lot of finance and a lot of companies are controlled by secret service. Not one secret service, since we have seven at least two secret services, three, are important in the economic life. In fact, they have monopolies in public procurement, in health and other things. And they are also party funding people, right? So for this small civil society party that we created, for this civil society party that we created, I apologize, I'm going to have a little bit of noise here. Uh, what, what happened is that funders were also telling us whom to work with. You say, okay, we're going to give you some money, but you're going to work with this political yeah. consultant, you know. I was not involved. I was only with a person with the idea. But I saw how this, how this happened, right? I will be off because I have a little bit of noise here. But what I mean is that there are so many informal realities here that even speaking in this plain language of, uh, you know, an independent company, a company which is autonomous from government, giving money to a party, uh, entirely falsifies the picture. It's really more complicated and more deep state. Great. Thanks a lot, uh, Alina, for your uh, initial thoughts on this. Um, let us uh, give a chance to Alex, maybe, if you want to. Okay. Make yes? Okay. Uh, well, uh, I, I agree with Alina about opportunities, but unfortunately, the, the global trend is for the, the governments to get more and more involved in the economy and the society in all kinds of uh, aspects in which a society functions. Uh, the percent of GDP which is concentrated into the uh, hands of governments uh, is constantly growing. And these amounts which will be disbursed centrally uh, tends to increase. So opportunities increase. So I'm a bit pessimistic of whether we can uh, stop and block this trend uh, because uh, what Alina said is very important. Actually, the opportunities, uh, when you see uh, uh, two huge trucks full of money, uh, uh, not many people can resist that. Uh, <clears throat> regarding the funding, uh, I also agree with Alina, there are many uh, ways uh, what I can share uh, is that uh, there have been some surveys done in Bulgaria uh, on the so-called uh, uh, purchased and controlled vote. Purchased is when you 
pay uh, people to vote for a certain party and the uh, controlled vote is when employers or uh, bureaucrats in smaller uh, uh, smaller uh, cities or villages uh, they demand from people to vote for a certain party uh, <clears throat> if they want to keep their jobs, etc., because government seems to be a big employer in small, smaller uh, settlements. Um, so the, this, uh, this, uh, the, la the latest estimates, uh, the April 2021 elections, now this is about 15%. This amount of about 15% of the vote. Another trick that uh, is being uh, directly used by parties uh, in collusion, all kinds of even uh, uh, parties which are competitors, they use this in collusion because they have servers in each electoral section. Is to uh, there were there were uh, the ballots. They were uh, main, the main uh, method used in the last elections for paper ballots. So if you, if you make more marks than one for the party you vote for, this is, uh, um, then the ballot is invalid. So we had uh, from about uh, two and a half or three million votes, uh, between 400 and 500,000 invalid votes. So this, this mechanism has, to, has been working quite uh, intensively. That's why uh, the, the, this government decided to use exclusively machine voting in uh, larger uh, voting uh, stations. Uh, regarding the funding, uh, uh, the, this Omerta rule seemed to, to dominate in Bulgaria, so there is no, we have not seen any proper investigation uh, <clears throat> beside the, the formal investigation of uh, uh, spending uh, uh, campaign uh, spending uh, of different parties so they uh, give formal reports of how much they spent and uh, these are also uh, not scrutinized very deeply and they are formally accepted all parties get the subsidy which is about uh, four euro per vote and they have been very um, a lot of populist proposals to reduce the this to 50 euro cents per vote uh, which is you hand over the, the parties to business funding uh, directly but um, uh, this is not the the amount of money which is used by parties to fund their activity and the ele electoral campaign actually companies contribute in kind and with this uh, mechanism uh, mechanisms of control and purchased votes and then uh, the money its influence and cash so uh, <clears throat> well uh, in the end, uh, in the end, uh, uh, there seem to be uh, some shady background agreements between parties because they uh, they are competitors, but at the same time they are buying votes in the same districts, so they have to agree on not attacking each other, and uh, the police is also included in this. It, it happens in some districts. Uh, the um, um, the, the vote buyers, though, who carry the bags with money, uh, they were uh, transported uh, from uh, place to place in a police car. So you can imagine the magnitude of the, the organization and uh, the type of things that happened. So uh, what Bulgarians hope is that there will be fair elections. So a lot of police chiefs have lost their jobs in the last month all kinds of arrangements are made, uh, these uh, machines instead of paper ballots are used and um, uh, we hold our thumbs and uh, lit candles <laughs> that, um, that there will be an effect on the elections, uh, which means that um, the, the, the party, the establishment parties, the so-called status quo parties, they are using all possible means uh, and uh, the party in power has the most resources to influence elections. And that's uh, one of the explanations why GERB won. Uh, they have had, uh, in the last 12 years, they have had three governments. And even in the last elections, they, uh, they were the first, and they, they got most of the votes. 
uh, but they didn't have enough uh, for a majority and nobody wanted to, to work with them to form a government. They had 27% of the vote. The second party had 17 uh, or 18. Yeah, so uh, they won the elections actually, Gerd, but they couldn't form a government. Nobody would work with them. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> they had the resources and they always, the governing party always has the resources. And it happens like Alina described. Um, you try to do something, uh, you, you have honest efforts uh, and um, try to push for common causes, anti-corruption, for example. But in the end, uh, all these efforts are in vain, they evaporate. Thanks a lot, Alex. Uh, Dimona, we are very few minutes left, but I would be very happy to hear your views on this uh, final question and then we have to close in a few minutes. Uh, well, I think that Alex was uh, really, really detailed about this. Uh, what uh, I can add is that for years now, the Bulgarians have been uh, have believed that uh, there are certain activities in the within the state which are not always legal that actually are used to fund the the, the party uh, which is uh, governing the country. Uh, usually, uh, contraband uh, money and uh, uh, bribes paid at the customs were used to be used to be mentioned. Uh, they they used to say uh, now this and this party would start to control the, who who takes the suitcases with the money from this and this uh, border border station. So uh, yes, Alex is completely right. Uh, the situation is, is grave. And uh, the thing is that this has fed a very uh, strong uh, sentiment in, Bul in the ordinary Bulgarians that any, uh, any public funding of parties is actually bad, which is not. But uh, the second party, uh, the, the, the strongest opposition party now, which uh, according to recent polls would uh, be seconds to GERP in the next elections, but very close or, or even will, will win the elections, they actually want to, 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 to take this uh, public funding from, from the parties at all, which would be bad for democracy, but this is what uh, the people want, or at least a part of the, the people want. And I have heard people who would say that I would vote for this party or for that party because a lot of business people uh, are members and they donate and if they are there, so there is something there, uh, which is kind of weird thing to say, but uh, it actually works for some people. So this, this connection, you know, we talk about democracy, we talk about anti-corruption, we talk about what we want from our societies, but we should not forget that there is a significant portion in our societies who actually wants to feed corruption. They want to benefit from corruption and they, they think that it's perfectly okay. You know, they, they see this is how the world works and they want a, a piece of the, of the pie. This is what they want. So how would we balance? I hope that we will find some balance actually. And what Alina says about uh, EU funds is particularly true. Um, whether this is a matter of national uh, identity, whether corruption is uh, a result of communism, whether it's from the Ottoman Empire, uh, it is often for debate. But I think that the, 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 biggest, the biggest task we need to, to, to solve is how to find this balance between what we are as a nation and what you want to achieve and uh, how to how to bring this corruption at, the, at least at, the, at more bearable levels. Uh, just to add a, a, a point to what Dimana said, uh, one, of, uh, one of the guys in the Magnitsky list, one of the sanctions, he is an oligarch and he controlled the, the be betting, the, the casinos and betting uh, business in Bulgaria. So he formed a party. In April, he got 3% of the vote. Can you imagine? He has been sent, uh, uh, the prosecution raised uh, uh, about 19 accusations. Murder, conspiracy to murder, fraud, whatever you can think of. And he, um, he was tipped and uh, flew to Dubai. So he is currently in Dubai. But he formed a party and got 3%. 
and he is now participating in the elections, even uh, though you have a Magnitsky ruling. So I don't know what will happen, but it will be very funny. Well, many people bet now, so you know you have a big constituency if you are in the betting business. He, he, he openly admitted that he bribed the Minister of Finance and the Prime Minister, paid 30 million euro over uh, two years. 30 million in order to get um, a tax uh, cut something, uh, uh, a favorable regime. Uh, so he, he did not pay 700 million, 350 million euro in taxes to the state. In, in exchange, he paid 60, uh, 30 million euro to the finance minister and the prime minister. That's what he said. Uh, <laughs> yeah, huge match. Thank you, huge Alex. I, I don't know whether to laugh or to cry, but uh, yeah. Uh, and this guy got 3% of the vote. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for ending in, on such a positive note. Let me add yeah, my yeah. own uh, positive note. Look, uh, it took uh, Denmark several decades to become clean, so well, yeah, the yeah. Indian area has uh, plenty of time ahead to, to progress. Uh, we have definitely seen uh, a complex picture with some mechanisms working, some uh, failing and progress in some areas and, and uh, no progress or backsliding in others. Thank you very much for all three of you for this excellent uh, panel discussion. Let me clap you in uh, uh, online. And I also would like to thank our audience who followed us or who will see us uh, later on Facebook. Please uh, uh, like us on social media, like uh, and look for other uh, Democracy Institute events. We're very much looking forward to having you again. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for having us. Bye-bye.